climate change and conversations that should create a balance between the environment and development are some of the issues that are most talked about globally. And so today we are hosting one of our very uh, intellect here in East Africa to really give us insights about what this balance is. So welcome. We really appreciate you for taking your time to speak to us. We'd like you to introduce yourself and tell us what you do. So I'm Dr. Nantongo Mary Coretti, and I'm a lecturer at the Department of Economics at the Makere University Business School in Uganda. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really privileged. Let's begin our conversation around the balance between environment and development. What does this entail and why is it a very big discussion globally? Yeah, so development is about ensuring that the society as a whole moves from one level of standard of living to the next. And to do that, uh, you need to use your natural resources. So for example, you need to use your oil, let's say, so that you can fuel your cars, run your industries, you know. You need to use your forest resources so that you can be able to get timber, so that you can be able to uh, use uh, charcoal, uh, like some of our communities that use charcoal. You need to use your land yeah, for agriculture and so forth. But the thing is, while you're using these resources, there is also a huge risk, and in fact, we've already seen it, that you're using these resources in a way that then creates a problem for you as the society that, use, that is using them to develop. So what we are trying to say is that you need to have this balance. You need to make sure that you're using the resources to be able to develop or to have economic growth as a society, but at the same time, not over-exploiting them so that it becomes unsustainable. And that's what uh, brings us to the conversation about sustainability. So you need to grow yeah, or develop in a way that balances, uh, to answer your question, that balances your development process, but also your environmental process or your natural resources, natural resource use, yeah. So what are the challenges around attaining this balance? Because we have policy makers and we have policy implementers. I believe there must be a gap around that because that is where the conversation is also going. So what is the gap and how can it be addressed? Yeah, because, you know, uh, most of these natural resources, people use them for private profit. So, for example, you are going to... Uh, let me use the example that's most common for us here in Africa, which is our forest resources. Uh, people exploit forests for different reasons. And one, like I told you, is to get timber. So the gentleman or lady who is exploiting that timber is exploiting it for their personal benefit so that they get a profit out of it. Or let's say if it's an oil field, like we just discovered uh, here um, in Kenya, but also in Uganda and some other South African countries, um, the companies that are exploiting this oil, they are exploiting it for a private profit. Now, the problem with the balance is that with this natural resource use, while the benefit is for the private individual, the problem which in economics we call the cost of utilization or the social cost is for the society as a whole. So the man, lady, who cuts down the forest, that means that the forest can now no longer make the rain in the man's uh, terms that is, uh, that is needed for everybody else to thrive. That's needed for the farmers to grow their crops. That's needed for... Uh, society to have good weather and also we know that the forests also they moderate the climate so if we are cutting down this forest then we are having um, what we call global warming so temperatures are rising around the world so what you do here in Kenya then will affect somebody in Australia it will affect somebody in uh, uh, some other place now it's the same thing with the oil so you're exploiting the oil for your own uh, private profit but at the end of the day, when those uh, oil fumes get into the atmosphere, they will affect everybody in the whole world. 
So you get global warming that's causing all of these problems that we all know are happening. So that is why it's a huge problem because policymakers, while they are there, they then have, they are interested, of course, in uh, economic growth because these people who exploit the oil, they, blah, blah, they, they, uh, they have, uh, they, they pay tax. So they are good for the economy. But at the end of the day, they create a social cost, which at the same time has to be catered for by government. Now, how the governments then have to work through policies which protect both the individual, yeah, the economic person, that, yeah, and then the society as well. And that balance is not very easy because like I told you, what happens in Europe will affect somebody in, in Kenya. And what happens in Kenya will affect somebody in, uh, let's say, China or Vietnam or somewhere else. So how do you get all of these problems, all of these issues to a state where policymakers can make policy that can support or make that balance. This is where, this is what the problem is. Yeah. Where do you think Africa is in solving this problem? Wow, that's a very good question. Um, first of all, Africa, we are not a huge contributors to this problem. Unfortunately, we are the most vulnerable to the problem of climate change. So uh, there is a global discussion, like you asked me, about how globally we can solve the problem. And Africa is taking part. Our policymakers, they are going to these um, uh, international negotiation uh, meetings. We call them uh, the COP. Yeah, yeah. So they are going there and uh, and um, and uh, giving their views. Also, African governments have done a lot to include climate policy, environmental policy, in their own national policies, in line with their development priorities. The problem that we have as Africa is while we are a, a net, uh, while we are very vulnerable yeah, to this and we did not create the problem, we do not have, unfortunately, the finances, the resources, the technical capacity to be able to protect ourselves from the effects of climate change. Yeah. So the issue of adaptability, how do you help farmers who are now faced with year in, year out loss of crops because of drought? How do you help them? Our governments are still struggling with other problems, you know, education, health, COVID, you know, so forth. So they are, uh, governments, I would say, are trying. They are doing their best, but they need, uh, we need more help, especially in terms of finance, especially uh, also in terms of um, capacity building so that our people can be able to manage, but also awareness. We can't look at ourselves as the victim. We also have a role to play in ensuring that going forward, okay, even if mistakes have been made in the past, we cannot continue to also be a part of the problem. We have to be part of the solution. So yes, we need to um, educate our people. And uh, governments have done very well in uh, putting in place the policy frameworks. Many governments are doing that. But now the implementation is where we have to go. As a scholar in Uganda, and I know you're one of the people who are amplifying this message around development and environment in Uganda. Are there special initiatives that you are doing apart from uh, being a lecturer in terms of letting people know that we can change the conversation around climate change? Yeah. So, uh, first of all, my main responsibility, I think, um, as a person is, and this is something that I'm very passionate about, which is I believe that sharing my knowledge, this has a huge uh, multiplier effects, you know. So first of all, my job as a researcher and a lecturer is very important to me because I believe there I'm in touch with so many young people and who can uh, then uh, move uh, this agenda forward. But apart from that, so I put a lot of emphasis on that and everywhere I go, I'm trying to see, uh, can we get, um, can we get scholarships? You know, for example, we just won a, a research project, a research and capacity building project for energy transitions, and we are training three PhDs and uh, six master students. 
And I think this is very, very important, first of all, that. But then uh, also supporting young people. I'm working with the, they're really like a, the beginning of this, but young people, uh, children, you could say, age 13, 14, 15, who are having this uh, like tree planting initiatives and hoping that we can support them. Because uh, the conversations that we're having now will be different. Having a long-term uh, outlook is very important. Yeah. If these people who are 13, 14, understand these issues, they have this awareness, then 10 years, 15 years, 20 years down the road, when they are the policy makers, it will be very easy they will, because they will have already be uh, part of the movement, part of the drive. You know, Right now, a lot of policy makers, you have to convince them. You know, they believe in, yeah. So we have to, to start young. And that's one of the things that I'm doing. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. And we wish you well as you continue um, engaging young people so that we have a better future for Africa. We believe that we'll visit Uganda sometime and we'll be able to meet and continue this discussion. So thank you so much. We appreciate it.